Good evening, buonasera, my name is Avinoam Shalem, and I'm welcoming you today to the discussion and the event called Rome for Soldiers. We are commemorating the June 4th, the day of Rome liberation in 1944. Now, why Rome for Soldiers? This event focuses on a specific educational project of the Allied forces of presenting the city of Rome to the soldiers. Today, as questions about intercultural encounters dominate our public sphere, it is quite interesting to reflect on cultural encounters and the army. Pictures of American soldiers pulling down Saddam's statue at the Firdos Square in 2003 or of Israeli soldiers at the Western Wall in Jerusalem in June 1967, or even those of the ISIS fighters entering the city of Palmyra and its archaeological park in 2015, were quickly spread on our media and became icons. Images for the celebration of end of battles and triumphs. Indeed, along the long history of civilization, soldiers were usually the very first people to encounter new cultures and even art. For example, medieval Arab historian elaborate about the astonishment and even ignorance of the Arab soldiers who entered Medain, namely Ctesiphon, the capital city of the Sasanian Empire on the banks of the Tigris in 637 of the Common Era. Others medieval sources recording the sack of Constantinople in 1204 inform us about the grand riches and wealth of Constantinople's churches and palaces treasures encountered by the mercenaries of the Fourth Crusade. Moreover, military regimes immediately established their power in these places and chief commanders in general took a major role in restructuring the social, religious, and even artistic life in the newly invaded regions. Sometimes specific buildings were erected. They were named after these generals, like Omar Mosque in Jerusalem, Okba Great Mosque in Karawan, and even major streets, boulevard, and square were named after these military figures. The immediate presence of military forces in these urban sites of the newly captured territories is a phenomenon set in the in-between sphere between wartime and peacetime, foreign military power and local social structure, administrative rule and local culture, and even between tourism as a method of acquiring knowledge and the exercising of authority and power. Presenting Rome and its treasures in guided book for soldiers in English and even in Hebrew, designed for the Jewish soldiers in the Allied forces, had varied political agendas. This event brings together several scholars, uh, Corey Brennan, Carlotta uh, Coccoli, and Frederick Whitling, and voices of eyewitnesses, the Ambasciatore Alessandro Cortese, De Bossis, and Principessa Elettra Marconi, to speak and reflect on the new image of Rome as produced for the Allied forces at the moment when the city was liberated. Now, let me explain how the evening is structured. We are going to open this evening with voices that will take us back to the past. It is a pre-recorded interview of the ambassador uh, of Alessandro Cortese de Bossis, who will speak for circa 16 minutes, a record which was made for this specific event. And then it will be followed by three comments of circa 10 to 15 minutes each of the three speakers that are here are with us on the screen. Um, and I will introduce them uh, quickly later. Uh, by the end, there will be also um, another pre-recorded interview of circa six minutes with the Principessa Elettra Marconi, which was made for this event uh, too. Um, so I would like to start by taking us into the voices um, of, um, of the past or voices that look into the past of uh, 
Alessandro um, uh, Cortese de Bosses. First, after the landing at Salerno, the great hopes started uh, coming out uh, in uh, September 1943. We uh, couldn't realize, uh, not being tacticians or uh, experts in uh, military strategy, how long it would be uh, the long fight from Salerno to Naples and then to Naples, from Naples to Cassino. So these were great hopes that uh, um, were not realized immediately. But then the second uh, chapter came after the landing at Anzio, when uh, the Americans decided to uh, land the whole army corps at uh, Anzio so that they could uh, cross over uh, um, the two uh, main uh, roads, the consular roads, the Casilina and the Appia, and cut all the provisions that were sent to Cassino, to the, to the uh, German army that was uh, 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 on those positions against uh, the 5th and the 8th armies. But uh, uh, General Clark had also a personal, direct, a personal directive uh, that it was less known, a personal directive from President Roosevelt, General Clark. Uh, it, this is not known uh, officially, but he went on a short military uh, leave to Washington in April 1944, and that's where he was met. He met uh, Gen uh, President Roosevelt, who uh, insisted that he should march on Rome early June, just a few days before the landing in Normandy. So this would increase the enthusiasm and the good uh, feelings of the public opinion and of the armies that were going to land, knowing that Rome was liberated. Uh, and this is what exactly what he did. He, mar he marched straight on Rome. He uh, arrived uh, on, on, in, on June uh, 4th, and I remember very well because at that time I was what, uh, what was called a Palatine Guard of the Pope. The Pope very generously, the Vatican very generously, had given this uh, degree uh, to many young people who would to, to subtract them, to free them from the military service. Uh, and uh, I was not yet 18, but uh, uh, there was also the danger that the Germans would capture you for uh, sending uh, the youth for military works uh, on the front of Cassino. And so uh, my family insisted with the Vatican and they gave uh, very kindly this uh, special degree of uh, guard of the, not the Swiss guard, the Palatine guard of the Palatine in the Palazzi, or the various Palazzi uh, of the Vatican. And so, and we were given a special card uh, in Italian and in uh, German, Vatican Staat, so that uh, we would not be taken by the Nazi police. And uh, we were at the Pontificia uh, Università Lateranense at St. John's uh, Square, and we uh, came out when the first tanks arrived, and we jumped over the tanks and we started discussing with the, with the infantry that was uh, in, uh, jump, jumping over the, the tanks themselves. And uh, that's where we started making friends with the first Americans who arrived the first armored division. And so the idea of joining the American army, joining the Liberation Army, came to me and became a, a sort of obsession. And that's what, what exactly happened after a few months. I was uh, lucky enough to be engaged in a group of uh, 200 young officers, Italian officers, 
who would act as intelligence and liaison officers with the various uh, allied regiments, American and, and, uh, and uh, British, uh, to find out exactly where the minefields were, where the enemy was hidden. But going back to Rome, uh, the question was also uh, rightly what was the feeling of the population in waiting for the uh, day of the liberation. I can uh, quote uh, a few friends uh, who were our guests uh, in uh, Piazza di Spagna. The home of Laura de Bosis was considered a, a true, a, a safe uh, place where the, to, where the partisans, the chiefs, could uh, meet and uh, well, it, it was safe because the whole palazzo was safe. There were also other anti-fascist families around and they were uh, very vigilant. They, they had organized the possibility of an evacuation in case of trouble, in case of arrival of spies or police on the roofs of the various uh, neighboring houses from Via Due Macelli, we could reach Via Gregoriana without uh, crossing any street, all, always on the roofs. <laughs> and, that's, and we had friends also in Via Gregoriana who would host us. It was like the partisans, you know, who uh, are hiding in all these places and help uh, uh, evacuate uh, the various uh, warriors and the various civilians. Of course, the, there was the curfew at uh, seven o'clock in the evening and the whole night, of course. And uh, the, uh, on, the, on June the 4th, we had a meeting at our house. And we, when uh, we heard uh, the bombing and the arrival of the first tank, we went downstairs and they were already arriving at Piazza di Spagna and going over to Via del Babuino and then to Piazza del Popolo, and uh, the significant event is that by intervention of the Pope, uh, not one single uh, vehicle, German uh, or, a, or, or a platoon or any member of the retreating forces was bombed or uh, machine gunned by the German, by the um, Allied air forces during the, the uh, evacuation in Rome. They started again after Ponte Milvio, but we remember the uh, RAF and the uh, US air force flying very low, uh, very low uh, altitude without ever firing a shot and the Germans evacuated because Rome was open city, it was called Roma Città Aperta. And so uh, it was on the protection of the Vatican. And uh, so we, we remember this, this episode after all the bombings. Uh, previously, uh, another event was very significant that uh, in the outskirts of Rome, the, uh, the um, all the vehicles, German and Italian, were bombed by the Allies, except the, tr the trucks, the lorries, uh, which were painted in uh, white and uh, yellow, the colors of the Vatican. They would go uh, in the outskirts, in the, in the outside fields, in the other villages to get food for the population and they, they were the only vehicles not bombed by by the uh, uh, allied forces that would make a sort of air siege of uh, of the outskirts so these were some of the experiences we lived uh, we some of them had known about uh, lauro about my uncle and uh, uh, there was an Italian-American uh, officer by the name of Giannini who had uh, known Lauro and he had become an American citizen, a British, sorry, a British citizen and British officer and he was one of the first ones to knock at our door in uh, Via Due Macelli and then we had uh, 
lunch together on the terrace and we and uh, he then he came over with other colleagues uh, and we spoke a lot and that's where I decided to to, uh, to join them and to uh, become a member of the uh, staff uh, the, well you know, of the military staff and go as long as uh, June, the last days were June uh, uh, 1945. I, I was in Rome for another month or so, but then I became, when, just a few days after the liberation of Rome, through some American friends who um, were, my, my grandmother was American, as you may know, and uh, some uh, American officers knew uh, her family, Vernon, in uh, Washington. And so they came over to, to meet her. And through them, I uh, was helped to become a, an employee of the, America, of the Allied Commission, a, a civilian organization which helped uh, a sort of uh, reorganization of food for the civilians and uh, uh, election of the new prefetti and so on, and uh, but from them I was sent to Florence, uh, to to Siena, as soon as Siena was liberated, and I asked to be sent there, to be near the front line and to be uh, there near the special office of the uh, general staff, which provided uh, emergency young officers as interpreters and uh, liaison officer in, in August or September uh, 44, I became one of them and was sent immediately to, an eighth Indi to the 8th Indian Division which, with which uh, we marched up to Ferrara. We had uh, a rather significant battle on the Senio river on the Santerno in Romagna near Ravenna and uh, unfortunately we were bombed by the Allied Air Force by mistake because we were so near the front line but then we succeeded in uh, crossing and wading the two or three rivers there. We had uh, a heroic uh, young uh, Sipoy who was given the Victoria Cross for his heroism which helped destroy two machine gun nests which were uh, prohibiting uh, the whole uh, company or the whole battalion to cross the river but then we succeeded in going over and uh, arriving at Ferrara and we had a wonderful day in the Palazzo d'Este in Ferrara. Then we crossed the Po and uh, we helped what was called uh, the 25 Aprile, the famous uh, insurrection of uh, northern Italy by the partisans. I remember a huge, a huge uh, sign which was uh, uh, put on on the Colosseum yes. and uh, the, the words were welcome, one down and two to go. <laughs> two to go would be Berlin and Tokyo. And this was, it, it remained there for many days and uh, for the soldiers, it was a kind of, uh, of rebirth. Can you imagine after spending months and months at Casino in the trench warfare, uh, arriving after the destruction of the Abbey of Casino, terrible event, arriving and entering Rome and then going to the Vatican and entering St. Peter, they were just with the open mouth wondering about uh, uh, how to enjoy this uh, incredible day, both for the Americans and Canadians and all the Commonwealth soldiers. It was a, 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 a wonderful event for all of them and for all of us, naturally, of course. I have uh, mentioned uh, the great popularity of uh, General Clark, uh, who was the first uh, the general in command of the Fifth Army, and then he came later in '45. He became, uh, thank you, president of the 15th Army Group of the two uh, armies, the 
British and the Americans. And he came to uh, the Quirinale when I was there in, as a diplomatic advisor to, the, to President Leone. President Leone, who gave a lunch in uh, uh, honor of General Clark on the anniversary of the liberation of Rome. And then I, I accompanied uh, the uh, general to uh, Florence uh, to the new military cemetery inaugurated in Florence. And uh, when we came back to Rome, he gave me a beautiful autograph, dear, which I can read if you like, and which I would like to leave uh, to the American Academy. Thank you, dear Mr. De Bosi, thank you again for your telegram on the occasion of the 37th anniversary of the liberation of Rome. Over the years, I have often thought how unusual it was for a foreign army to invade a country like yours, bring damage and destruction to it, and still maintain the love and affection of the people. The help of the Italian military and the people of the country gave us all during the war was tremendous. I am also grateful for your firm service with me at that time. Mrs. Clark joins me in best wishes to you and Mrs. De Bosis, General Clark. And this I would like to leave uh, as a historical document to this wonderful academy. Thank you. Um, we are moving to the other voices of this evening. Uh, I'm going to introduce the uh, three of them. We're going to start with Corey Brennan. Corey, just raise your hand that people will know who you are. He's a professor of classic at Rutgers University. We are going to, this uh, talk of his is pre-recorded and later on uh, we are going to hear the architectural historian Carlotta Cocolli, who is an associate professor at the Università degli Studi di Brescia and the historian Friedrich Wittling, um, who is the senior research fellow at the Finnish Institute in Athens. So we'll start with you, Corey. My presentation is um, pre-recorded as well. Uh, I wanted to make sure that I uh, got it all within about 15 minutes or so. So if we can uh, share the video. The Allied entry into Rome was made as the wheels of the mighty invasion machine were already turning. Everyone is, or at least should be familiar, with the scenes of the 4th of June, 1944 when Allied troops entered Rome, the first of the Axis capitals to fall. So what happened next in Rome for the next 12 to 18 months? The scholar who's done the most to answer this question is Carolyn Anderson, Professor Emerita of Communication at University of Massachusetts Amherst, and I'm delighted to say, a visiting scholar of long standing at the American Academy in Rome. The first wave of troops, as Anderson notes, did not linger long enough in the city to do much tourism. By June 8th, the U.S. 5th and British 8th armies moved northward toward Pisa and Florence to confront German troops, and the commanding general of the U.S. 5th Army, Mark Clark, stayed no more than a week in Rome. Yet in the months that followed, says Anderson, for soldiers, a holiday in Rome became part of a larger award system a compensation for the sacrifices of war, and a coping mechanism. Of the 750,000 American troops who served in Italy in World War II, she continues, not all of them spent leave time visiting Rome, but tens of thousands did. Leaves were typically for two or three days. Many thousands of British and Commonwealth soldiers also found themselves on leave in Rome, or even stationed in the city with at least a little time on their hands. Most troops left after VE Day in May of 1945, but the Allied presence in Rome continued into 1947. To get at the experience of the American soldier in liberated Rome, especially in the 11 months from early June 1944 to early May 1945, 
Carolyn Anderson offers the following general points as a foundation to her study of what she calls Rome's accidental tourists. That tourism was a crucial aspect of the experience of occupying soldiers, that military authorities encouraged and attempted to control tourist and leisure activities of soldiers on leave and those stationed in occupied cities, and third, that they issued soldiers' guides outlining uh, recommended and forbidden locations and behaviors, and here the tour itineraries differed little from pre-war and post-war circuits. There's other conclusions, too. But Carolyn Anderson offers an essential point how important all this was to the home front. The figure of the happy GIS tourist in Rome became a welcome contrast to grim images of combat circulated in American newspapers and magazines, prefiguring the important role the American tourist would play in post-war Italy. Indeed, and this is one of the main points of my contribution today, we're most fortunate in having what I think is an extraordinary collection of images from the Life magazine archives, mostly unpublished photos of Allied soldiers interacting with the city of Rome in 1944 by two important war photographers, New Zealand-born George Silk and Carl Maidans. Well, both had served terms as prisoners of war before coming to Rome. What Silk and Maidens have in common is that they very much photographed the war from the viewpoint of the ordinary soldier or sailor. Now, for the context, you have to read Carolyn Anderson's article, which has it all. The events of the 4th and 5th of June 1944, which you can variously call the liberation, capture, fall, or occupation of Rome after months of hard fighting, where the troops slept and their officers stayed and how military rank and class distinctions were enforced, where they ate and drank amid severe rationing and where they danced and had sex, where in Rome they toured, how they found their way and what they were told to steer clear of, how they behaved and misbehaved, the role of non-military organizations ranging from the Red Cross to religious groups to the Vatican, eventually efforts at medium-term education, including by our own American Academy in Rome. One of the most valuable attributes of Carolyn Anderson's work is that she sorts out the main pocket-sized guidebooks that served American troops in Rome. There's four in all, each produced by a different entity. And for that, she used the copies in our own American Academy in Rome library. It's very confusing since these guides are generally undated and three of the four have essentially the same title and all but one are anonymous. Here, Anderson supplements efforts by Adolfo Mignemi along uh, the same lines. Those core guidebooks are endlessly fascinating. Everything about them, their layout, their content, choice of photographs, their tone, how they seem to have been used, where they're found today. Uh, each had a map, but they're all different. And naturally, each one of them supposes that the reader, a soldier, had a very finite amount of time. Now, Officially produced soldiers' guidebooks are very much a phenomenon of the Second World War. As Adolfo Mignemi has shown, those found in World War I were the result of private initiative and filled with advertisements. Starting in 1940, the Italians produced soldiers' touristic guides for occupying forces in Albania and Greece and Croatia and Tunisia. And the Germans already in 1942 created a soldier's Blitzführer, a lightning guide, through Rome. For the U.S. military in World War II, officers always had zone handbooks classified as secret. The first of the American guidebooks geared toward enlisted men came only in 1943 with Soldier's Guide to Sicily, remarks Andrea Camilleri of the contents. If you skip the chapter dedicated to the mountains and rivers and delete the names of the cities, the guide would also be valid for Sardinia, Corsica, and any other region of southern Italy. Also, the Soldier's Guide to Italy, which soon followed, had much to say in particular about the dangers women posed to the troops. Do not think that it will be easy for you in Italy to pick up a respectable girl without incurring a furious quarrel. And remember that not a few Germans have prematurely ended their days by making such attempts. The guidebooks for the capital were not ready in time for the 4th of June. General Mark Clark, on entering the city, notoriously had a hard time finding his way to the Campidoglio. But after the ones for Rome appeared, others soon followed as the Allies pushed their way north. A soldier's guide to Florence, a soldier's guide to Tuscany, a soldier's guide to Umbria, a soldier's guide to Emilia, and the one for Tuscany noted this guide has been passed by the United States censor and may be mailed home. The others presumably weren't. Taken as a whole, 
these later guidebooks, including the ones for Rome, are much less prescriptive about personal behavior than the ones for Sicily and Italy. And there's nothing like the cover for the later Soldier's Guide to Germany with this stern warning against fraternization. But the Rome guides do occasionally reveal anxiety about Allied conduct, especially the first of the series. Soldier's Guide to Rome. On its cover, you can see the head of the Apollo Belvedere, uh, which is in the Vatican Museum's complex, 42 pages in all. We're told it has been written by the Monuments and Fine Arts Subcommission of the Allied Control Commission and was designed and produced by Psychological Warfare Branch Allied Force Headquarters. It was printed in Rome. In the foreword, General Harold Alexander of the British Eighth Army credits its composition to Lieutenant Colonel Ernest de Wald, director of the so-called Monuments Men for Italy, an eminent scholar of medieval and Renaissance art at Princeton, later director of its museum. And General Alexander adds a nervous word of his own. The eyes of all the world are upon our actions in the Eternal City, and we will show the world by our example the high standard of conduct and bearing of our victorious allied armies. Now, I can't get over the aerial photo, uh, which is clearly reconnaissance for bombing of a type familiar from the Aerophototeca here in uh, Rome. Also in the frontispiece, the Lupa Capitolina, uh, reappropriating it from Mussolini. And within, a map of the city and an art historical itinerary uh, from ancient Rome to modern Rome. The Allies did not just publish and distribute this guide, they advertised it as well. Carolyn Anderson says, a posed shot of British Everyman, Gunner Smith, consulting the soldier's guide, showed up in commercial magazines in the US and UK. The photograph demonstrates how the Allied Control Commission chose to control the image of Allied troops as clean-cut tourists in Rome for the eyes of the world. Well, Everyman is precisely the correct word. For British audiences, at least, the name Gunner Smith will have evoked the thoughts of a weekly radio program that ran through all of the war years, 1939 through 1945. Gunner Smith Entertains. This was a musical program that purported to be broadcast from a troop camp somewhere in England. Now, there was also an abbreviated souvenir guide prepared by the British Army Education and U.S. Special Services Rome Area Command. This is just eight pages in all, with a map of the city, oriented, strangely, with southeast at the top. And again, you can see here the lupa. These and all the other Rome guides were printed in massive quantities, to judge from the frequency with which they come up on eBay and similar. A copy of any of the soldier's guides can usually be had online for under $10, not including postage. They use stock images for illustrations and not the monuments as they appeared at that time. And I think this is an important point, easily forgotten. Many of the major monuments in Rome since 1940 had received protection against aerial bombardment with everything from removal of glass in the case of the Arapacus to sandbagging to concrete casing. Now compare this rendering of the Arch of Constantine and the Soldier's Guide to Rome with an image how it actually appeared at the time. Of the two life photographers, it's interesting, the work of my dolls thoroughly avoids showing monuments with anti-bombardment protection, whereas Silk more unflinchingly shows it. Now, after this first pair of Allied-produced guides, two booklets followed, aimed specifically at American troops. In 48 pages, A Soldier's Guide to Rome, prepared by the Morale Services Section, Headquarters, Services of Supply, North African Theater of Operations. The book is anonymous, but I can report that I've identified the author, one Charles Frank Barwick of Guthrie, Oklahoma, 32 miles north of Oklahoma City. He had an undergraduate degree in journalism from the University of Oklahoma and a PhD in political science from George Washington University. He also authored The Soldier's Guide to Naples. Now, the Rome booklet offers five separate tours. Finally, in 1945, in 94 pages, by far the longest, A Soldier's Guide to Rome, uh, compiled and published by the Information and Education Section, Headquarters, Mediterranean Theater of Operations, USA. Well, on the cover, you can see here the Arch of Titus, which also uh, then was sandbagged. At least the version that I've seen dates to March or April of 1945, based on internal clues. And this is the chattiest of the group of guides, uh, urging, for instance, GIs to go to the Villa Borghese to see the nude sculpture that shocked Hitler, and then helpfully offering a full-page photo of the artwork on the next page. 
and more itineraries are offered, followed by a list of clubs, theaters, restaurants, and churches. Notably, it's the first to incorporate war tourism into its itineraries. I have to emphasize that there were many more guides in circulation. Just from the second half of 1944 for Rome, the most ambitious is that of American Express. Rome, 3,000 years and 15 minutes with a suggestive front and back cover. Also, see Rome in a day. Souvenir and guidebook, the Canada Club of Rome, 24 pages. And it'd be worthwhile to see whether one could actually do this ambitious itinerary in a day. I've actually been to each of these sites, but it took me three years. There's also Rome, Guide for Jewish Soldiers, published by the Jewish Services Club in Rome, 64 pages with photographs and a map, and the text is in both Hebrew and English. For Catholic soldiers, a bird's eye view of Rome, and the list can go on. I'd like to end, however, by stressing one commonality in all four of the main soldiers' guides. Surprisingly positive reception of not just fascist architecture, but also the massive urban interventions of the later 1920s and the 1930s. Guide number three, that with the uh, Piazza San Pietro on the cover, talks about the 1930s avenues almost as if they were Parisian boulevards and organizes itineraries around them. Also, the Foro Mussolini figures in all the maps and guides. And at first glance, this comes as a surprise since it lay two kilometers north of the Vatican and was no more than 15 years old. And most important of all, was the most strident expression of fascist ideology that Mussolini had set. Indeed, early Allied planning in the war, starting in November 1940, had contemplated bombing the Foro Mussolini, along with several other strategic sites in Rome, such as Stazione Termini. In the event, the United States military converted Foro Mussolini into the 5th Army Rest Center on the 19th of June, 1944, just 14 days after Allied troops had entered the city. Renamed as Foro d'Italia, and still later Foro Italico, the rest center for the remainder of 1944 and for much of 1945 housed about 2,500 soldiers at a time, most staying for just a few days before redeployment. Many tens of thousands of especially American, British, and French soldiers will have experienced the site before war's end. I find the guide for the Foro d'Italia in at least two editions to be of extreme importance. Unlike the other Rome guides, which use stock pre-war photos, the Rest Center guide introduced new contemporary images, which provides a remarkable record of the buildings and spaces designed by Luigi Moretti, Ernesto Del Debbio, and others, and how the GIs use them inside and out. In a word, the U.S. military kept the Foro Mussolini site essentially intact, interiors and exteriors, especially since it aimed that it continue its old fascist athletic and instructional focus, but now for allied uses for soldiers in the North African and Italian zones. So Rome acquired an additional purpose, added to that of center for soldier tourists, namely as a city of sport. As such, the rest center would host any number of morale building events, ranging from inter-allied boxing competitions in Moretti's uh, Fencing Academy, which was now renamed Building B, to a beauty contest uh, in the shadow of Mussolini's obelisk. Rome, near the Mussolini pylon, an army rest center becomes the training camp for the Allied Boxing Championships. American, British, and French soldiers from African and Italian zones complete training for a week-long boxing tournament. There is a lot going on here and there's much to discuss. If I had to sum up my own thoughts in just one sentence, I would say that an examination of the abundant but rather neglected American and British material from this era suggests that the Allies issued their various guidebooks to the Eternal City for both practical reasons, but also to create a dramatic and reassuring message for their own propaganda purposes during a war that in Europe would rage for 11 more months following the liberation of Rome. Thank you so much, Corey. And we are moving now into the next uh, speaker. Please, Carlotta, the podium is yours. Yes, thank you. Can you see my presentation? Yes, we do. If you just okay. go into full Thank screen. you very much. So um, as we know, the Allied 
promoted a large cultural training activity in the field that uh, resulted in the publication of a vast series of guides and articles with the aim of illustrating to each soldier the artistic and natural beauty of uh, Italy. Uh, much of the artistic information appeared in general handbooks for soldiers, the tourist guides, and also articles in magazines and the newspapers, which were widely circulated among the troops. And the text was often written or inspired by the Monuments, Fine Arts, and the Archives Subcommission. The aim was simple, was to raise the soldiers' uh, awareness of the importance of the rich historical and artistic heritage of the country that were fighting in, whose uh, salvation was an integral part of the army's tasks. Indeed, it should be not forgotten that one of the main obstacles that the monuments officers had to face was the lack of consideration that their mandate met with among high military officials and troops. Therefore, a large part of the, the activity they carried out in those areas uh, was the prevention of theft and damage to monuments, mainly caused by the Allied troops themselves. One of the soldiers' attentions to the cultural heritage of Italy was done through the publication of a series of more general cultural and artistic information in periodicals such as the American Stars and Strips, the British Cruiser, or Q for the New Zealand troops. The articles were often based on common places about Italy and Italians or on topics particularly dear to the Anglo-Americans and uh, capable of arousing uh, feelings of closeness, belonging, or respect. Among this documentation, of course, um, a particular interesting corpus is that of the so-called soldier's guide, uh, tourist guides intended for allied soldiers and uh, dedicated to the most important and artistically relevant Italian regions or cities. The first guides uh, were those devoted to Italy and Sicily, uh, which date back to 1943. The soldier's guide to Italy, this one, the first, aimed at calling the alleged bad behavior of uh, the Nazi Germans and fascists towards Italy's cultural heritage, while a clear emphasis was put on the responsibility that the allies were about to, to assume for protecting these treasures. This guide, entitled um, Notes on the History, Art and Monuments of Italy, was compiled by Captain Mason Hammond, professor of classics at Harvard, and the very first monuments officer to land in Italy. The first important city on which the Allies focused their tourist attention was Naples with six uh, guides dedicated to the city and its surroundings. This vast production um, was not only due to, to its artistic importance, but also to a change in strategy on the part of the Allied Army, which um, chose to give greater importance to, the, to protecting the Italian artistic heritage. There is no doubt that the military inquiry into the shameful conduct of the Allies toward the artistic heritage of Naples marked a watershed and demonstrated that it was essential for all military ranks to become aware of their responsibility regarding respect for cultural sites. This could only be done from the bottom up and by taking advantage of what a city like Naples could offer any soldier, directing the organization of uh, his free time toward cultural activities such as guided tours. The Soldier's Guide to Naples, the first one of uh, 1944, emphasized the responsibility for the damage and depredation carried up carried out by the retreating Germans, but at the same time concealed the fact that, for example, the Royal Palace of Naples was at that time occupied and partly used as a, 
a serviceman club for British soldiers, a situation that greatly worried the Italian superintendent of fine arts, who described it as a palace reduced to a bastille attacked and devastated by the fury of the people. It might be suggested that the publication of the guide dedicated to the Royal Palace, this one, uh, edited by the monuments officer and curator of the British uh, Museum in London, Edward Croft Murray, was clearly linked to this situation of tension with the Italian fine arts officials. In the introduction, emphasis is put on the fact that the new direction has been taken to ensure the protection of the palace from further damage. Here again, the well-known good manner of the British people are used to insist on the need uh, to respect the antiquity and the beauty of the building. Speaking of Rome, as, as we already um, listened, the liberation of the city was a source of great concern. It was the first European capital to be liberated, but also the fountain of civilization according to General Alexander, who wrote uh, the introduction of the Soldier's Guide to Rome, uh, edited in 1944 by uh, the Major Ernst Theodor de Valde, the director of the, the MFA in, in Italy. Uh, other four guides, um, guides dedicated to Rome um, were also an opportunity to underline the shameful behavior of the Germans compared to that of the Allies. The guides dedicated to uh, Florence were presumably all published around the time of the liberation of the region between July and August 1944. A soldier's guide to Florence, the red one, the picture, was uh, also prepared by Major David and printed at the beginning of uh, July 1944. Indeed, a tourist route was proposed across the bridge over the Arno, mined by the Germans and blown up, as we know, between the 3rd and the 4th of August 1944. This guide also spe specified that Florence is the birthplace of Amerigo Vespucci, the navigator for whom America was named. Thus, a connecting thread between Florence and the Americas is mentioned. Another guide to Florence, the, this one in the middle, uh, was edited by Major Jeffrey Blake Palmer, a New Zealand medical doctor with an interest in archaeology. It was published after the liberation of the city and uh, it opened with a brief account uh, of the damage suffered by Florence, including the demolition of uh, five of the six bridges that have been mostly efficiently demolished by the retreating Huns. Barbarity was set vis-a-vis -vis civilization and the memories of the fall of the West by the Nordic Huns were evoked again. So in order to conclude my very short speech, it could be said that an initial uh, examination of this rich material reveals an attempt to transmit to the Allied tro troops curiosity and respect for a collective cultural heritage heavily damaged by Allied bombing and considered to be the very foundation of Western civilization. The Germans were set, set out of Western story of civilization and dealing with Italy's fascist past was simply ignored. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Carlotta. If you just uh, stop sharing, thank you. And we are moving to Frederick. Uh, please, Frederick. We can't hear you. Thank you very much. Can you hear me now? Yes. Uh, right. Thank you, and thank you for this the invitation to take part in this uh, 77th anniversary uh, event. Uh, it's very nice to be part of this. Uh, this uh, brief presentation will uh, fire away a number of images 
Um, I came across a lot of material uh, relating to the monuments uh, to fine arts and archives when I was uh, working in the archives of the American Academy and the British School a number of years ago, and it's nice to reconnect to this. Uh, so as we've learned, I'll try to fill in a few gaps here, hopefully, with, uh, in res with respect to the, the previous presentations. Um, Rome was the first capital to be liberated from uh, Nazi German occupation <clears throat> on the 4th of June 1944. And it was hoped that the capture of uh, the Italian capital might draw German troops away from France and the impending D-Day landings, which is another chapter to which we might uh, possibly return. I'll try to give a brief historical context here uh, with fragments um, following on uh, Ambassador de Bosse's and also the, the previous uh, presentations. Uh, there's a focus here on images from the book Rome, 4th of June 1944, The Liberation in Color uh, by Umberto Gentiloni Silveri and others, published in 2011, uh, at, the, um, at the same time as an exhibition took place in Rome with the same images. Here we see one of them, and I'll return to, this is another one of the series of the so-called Gunner Smith um, um, series that we've already heard about previously. I'll return to them. Color images, one might add, was still an experiment at the time, which is, I think, uh, quite an important point. There are, of course, other publications uh, recently, La Liberazione di Roma by Gabriele Ranzato, uh, et cetera, and others uh, on this topic, which is a vast one indeed. Um, here are images from this exhibition in 2011 that I mentioned um, with some of these color photographs. I'll return to, to some of them shortly. And here's another one, including the stamp that, was, that the US Army Signal Corps gave um, the photographs that they were, they were taken. So could, could Rome risk being bombed? This was a recurring question raised after Italy's entry into the war in 1940 bombed then for deterring uh, effects, psychological and military. Papal pleas, as it were, recurred uh, to safeguard the physical heritage and, heritage and patrimony of the city, declaring it a Citta Santa. Um, and this can also be seen in relation to uh, various military A, B and C lists or listing important cultural heritage sites in order of importance, in case things had to be bombed, to please, by all means, uh, avoid the following, and so on. Um, moving on, uh, as we've heard already, but I'll repeat it very briefly, <clears throat> the British 8th Army, General Montgomery, and the American 7th Army, General Patton, landed on Sicily in July 1943, beginning the Italian campaign and bringing the Allied battle against the Axis powers to the European continent. The fall of Mussolini occurred on the 25th of July and the German occupation took, uh, took over in September, establishing importantly the so-called Gustav line across the peninsula at uh, Monte Cassino, south of Rome. Um, I will uh, briefly then, uh, before I get to Rome, <laughs> uh, spend a few, a few seconds or a few minutes on at Anzio, which was already mentioned by the ambassador, but it's, I think it's poss possibly important to repeat, also promoting the rather nice little beachhead um, museum, which is on site, which I would actually personally recommend visiting. Uh, some of the, these images I apologize for the quality of, but uh, maybe it's simply more important to show them anyway. Uh, this is a rather fanciful artwork from the museum, which is uh, all about celebrating the, uh, the Allied landing at uh, Anzio on the 22nd of January, 1944. Uh, here are historical images of uh, Anzio and the Riviera, uh, this site. Um, an, an interesting little American connection, which uh, is possibly rather unknown, the, uh, the uh, underwater cable from Anzio to New York in the, in the 1920s, the Ital cable, a very important thing. Uh, but as I said, the, the landing at Anzio was a, a key factor, trying to uh, Cut, cut, cut around the so-called Gustav line and land closer to Rome. And of course, the idea was to then proceed as soon as possible to Rome, which ended up being not the case. Uh, a number of propaganda images from this period uh, portraying the Nazi atrocities and so on. Um, below, we see that one of the, one of the installa installation guns that the, the Germans were using for the defense and uh, a number of people involved in uh, 
in the answer landing and afterwards, and also images uh, re referring, for example, to the fight against malaria in the, in the area, and also rather fanciful British uh, rendition of the so-called Ansior Ritz Hotel, a little uh, hole in the wall shed in the, in the middle of nowhere. Um, various other images of the actual landing and uh, the, the mine clearance on the beaches and so on. This is all as a background to, uh, you, you can't have a liberation without having an army that actually liberates. Uh, ending with this image, which is uh, obviously much later, which is Prince Charles and Lady Diana with uh, Giulio Andriotti visiting one of the uh, Allied war cemeteries in, uh, in the area. So the Anzio landing was followed by months of fighting uh, before the so-called Operation Diadem in May 1944, when the Gustav line was to be broken. One of the results of this was the destruction of the monastery at Monte Cassino, which we know about. <clears throat> this was done by the British 8th Army and the American 5th Army. <clears throat> the idea was to then march to Rome from Anzio. Uh, and General Harold Alexander, that we've already heard about, who wrote the, the uh, introduction to the book, uh, told his soldiers that the worst is behind you. And after several attacks, the German commander Kesselring decided to abandon the Gustav Line defenses on the 25th of May, which opened the way for the Allied advance. There were, however, some signs of tension and clashes between the Allied high commands, and uh, the Vatican engaged in diplomatic attempts to try to uh, avoid any confrontation between the liberators and the occupiers, let's say. The special status of Rome was uh, repeatedly invoked on historical grounds, the American army was uh, adamant to, to not bomb and no, and no material destruction, taking a moral high ground, if you like, vis-a-vis -vis Germany. Uh, the British were more focusing on obtaining military results on the ground rather than maintaining the Città Aperta status, perhaps. The Germans would uh, not allow allied movements in the open city, therefore one might discuss how open that city actually was, but that's another story. So the idea was let's liberate Rome and take it from there. And uh, the American army emphasized that it's important to take the city well. Um, possible joint allied statements were, were discussed beforehand. Uh, the idea was that if, we, if we're gonna destroy anything, it has to be only military targets, leaving any responsibility for destruction of the city and its heritage to the Germans. Uh, this was a general idea. The Spanish government offered to intervene as intermediary with the German government. Also, the Pope offered to uh, deploy his services as go-between. So the idea of Rome, Rome as Città Aperta had been declared by Mussolini's successor, Pietro Badoglio, uh, in August 1943. Uh, and the British, above all, were opposed to uh, maintaining this status in 1944, as the only, the only ones who would benefit from this would be the Germans. And that was, this was the general argument, that the military benefit would only be to Germany, um, and at the same time, there was no intention of attacking Rome as such as a city. It was to be avoided at all cost. Um, so, Citta Santa, the Vatican, <clears throat> reference were, being, were continually also made to the Roman Catholic population in the, in the USA, which is interesting, stressing one of the reasons to avoid attacking Rome was its universal religious heritage. And as I already said, the Germans would be given all blame for any possible destruction in Rome. At the same time, the destruction at the monastery at Monte Cassino was a terrifying warning of what could be if all hell was, as it were, let loose in Rome. Um, <clears throat> here we have an image of two Spitfires flying in north, as it were, from, um, from Anzio towards uh, south of Rome, just five days after the landing at, uh, at Anzio. This is one of the color images that I'll return to here. Uh, <clears throat> the capture of Rome, which uh, eventually occurred here, of course, had a very high propaganda value indeed, and uh, President Roosevelt had hinted that Rome was to be conquered by American troops. The British and US armies were originally to have reconvened before reaching the Aurelian walls. The idea was to take the city together. Instead, General Mark Clark, that we've heard about already, the US general decided not to wait for the British army and advanced with the additional motive of trying to hold up as many German forces elsewhere than France as possible, as I, as I hinted at before. So the original plan to cut off the German line of retreat was uh, abandoned. And as a result of this decision, the German 10th Army managed to escape capture and could continue its defense of Northern Italy. 
Italy, Italian forces fighting alongside the Allied armies were sent to the Adriatic Front and couldn't participate in the liberation of the capital. So, marching towards Anzio, here's one of one of many images of this uh, from Anzio to Rome. Sorry, one of many images of this um, this event. Um, we heard about the destruction of the several German military vehicles. Here we have one of them, <clears throat> and eventually reaching Rome. Various images, some of not so not very good quality, but it gives you the general idea of uh, the general the general feeling in the population and uh, and also uh, the awe perhaps of the of these soldiers that you see on the Via Fori Imperiali, admiring one of the fascist uh, sculptures there. Um, also, the, a lot of images that portray uh, the Allied armies as being helpful to the to the civilian population, very useful, of course. Uh, and I'll end uh, temporarily with this image here from the Piazza Venezia, two versions of the same, uh, the same event, more or less staged, presumably. So, 4th of June, liberation of Rome, almost five months after the, the landing at Anzio. Uh, this became worldwide news, of course, as the first European capital, and more importantly, the first Axis capital to fall will be taken. As we've already heard, Roosevelt stated that this was as quote one up two to go with reference to berlin and tokyo also referring to this sign that we heard about from the Colosseum, which was mentioned by ambassador de Bosis. and i'm going to give the floor here if i if i can to president roosevelt himself it's worth capturing this this one minute of his um, an edited version let's say of his speech the day after the um, the uh, liberation of rome sorry here we go there we are the military situation following the fall of Rome calls forth this message from the President of the United States. The first of the Axis capitals is now in our hands. One up and two to go. It would be unwise to inflate in our own minds the military importance of the capture of Rome we shall have to push through a longer period of greater effort and fiercer fighting before we get into Germany itself. Therefore, the victory still lies some distance ahead. That distance will be covered in due time. Have no fear of that, but it will be tough and it will be costly. So I extend the congratulations and the thanks of the American people to all the brave officers and men in the armed forces of the United Nations. May God bless them and watch over them and over all of our gallant fighting men. Right, and I'll give you 20 seconds of this uh, color feature film from the uh, from the, the liberation of Rome as well. Jeep. That will do. <clears throat> Thank you. There's nothing like uh, moving images to uh, illustrate a story. I find it interesting that Roosevelt refers to the United uh, Nations, but that's uh, that what it, and, uh, predating the, the formation of the of the UN. So I'll uh, end this presentation here with uh, a couple of images from the actual uh, soldiers' guide context that we we're talking about. Uh, it was, in, it was important to have a visible allied physical presence in the streets to maintain order, and this due to a state of semi-starvation and hunger, as the city was in essence still cut off from the rest of the world with staggering rates of inflation and, uh, and black market and uh, lack of food, essentially. We have an image of the flower bags here, for example, and also soldiers queuing up in line for a restaurant. Um, 
the liberation was a piece of a large scale war puzzle, although an important one. And uh, of course, the news of the capture of Rome was overshadowed two days later by the D-Day landings in, um, in Normandy. Here we have an image of uh, an Anglo-American conversation at St. Peter's, the soldiers after the liberation, and a number of uh, people, uh, soldiers literally thronging around the Pope, <laughs> Pius XII, and also an, an American soldier window shopping uh, for souvenirs, which was also part of this, um, the context. There was, it has been described, a strange mixed atmosphere of battle and holiday. We've already seen this image of the Fifth Army Rest Center at Foro Italico, uh, Foro Mussolini. We also have an American band with a Red Cross girl uh, who is uh, taking part. We have uh, soldiers playing flipper games. We have uh, curious soldiers investigating the, uh, the mosaics at Foro Italico. We have uh, the swimming pools, the Balilla swimming pools used by, um, by soldiers in, uh, in the heat of the summer, contrasted by the image of these women washing, doing their washing in the, um, at the Fontana di Trevi. Speaking of pictures, this is an image of, from the Life magazine. Um, in June 1944, which I find quite interesting, where there is a, an, a deliberate reference to the neoclassical architecture in New York City and other US cities with that of Rome. Some of Italy looks like home to US soldiers, it claims, which is a, an interesting context. We also have an in, image of this information booth advertising guided tours of Rome for these Italian soldiers at the Foro Italico and also an image of the sculpture of Moses, San Pietro in Vincoli. Frederick, try to sum up. Your yes, I'm, I'm, on, I'm absolutely on my way. So I'll, I'll, I will end with this uh, series of images of uh, this uh, day in Rome with Gunnar Smith, the stage series of photographs, advertisement of the image of the Allied soldier as a poster boy. Uh, we have this Gunnar Smith moving through Rome, uh, in various staged settings, which are all of them quite fascinating, ending suitably in uh, having a drink in a bar. <clears throat> various other similar context images here, a soldier in front of the Arch of Septimius Severus on the Forum Romanum, but also in the, this should be understood in the context of these leave courses that have been hinted at for servicemen and women orientating courses at the American Academy and the British School of Archaeology, Topography and Art History. Um, one of the, uh, the teachers and go-betweens there was the Swedish director, Erik Sjökvist. So I'll end here with uh, an image of uh, an RAF organist playing the organ at St. Peter's. Uh, the allied sports events that we uh, heard about that took place in the heat of summer in July, the Foro Italico. And symbolically, this, these various handshake images between uh, British and American, uh, American soldiers. Um, at, uh, that took place also with the symbolical pro propaganda value again. A propaganda value, value, this is the last image that can perhaps be nicely summed up here, where the victors are always in the driver's seat of the historical narrative. This is a prerogative that one has. And uh, here you see a soldier with a mother and baby pointing in the direction of the future and the future of the country. The significance of the event of the liberation of Rome is multi-layered, complex, and uh, deserves much attention. Thank you very much. Thank you, Frederick. Thank you so much. And they, um, I'm just um, going to end this uh, event with a short, pre-recorded interview of circa five minutes with the Principessa Elettra Marconi. We will hear her and then we will come back just for concluding this evening and thank you words. If we don't have time, this is a short event with no question and answers. So if you have any question, please shoot them into the uh, chat box. We will keep them and I will make sure that this will go to the speakers uh, today. So we can go on now with the next uh, pre-recorded video, another voice of a Roman at the day of the liberation. Please, Tim. Uh, the war has been a nightmare, terrible bombardments and the frightening. I was always listening to uh, Radio London, you know, 
but, but uh, secretly, without uh, uh, letting anybody know, because it was very dangerous. The Germans were terrible. We couldn't go out. We were all uh, in our houses. And uh, when we were going out, it was always dangerous. For, for the boys, it was impossible because they were um, always in danger, yes. And then uh, we knew that there was um, uh, the, the, the wonderful moment that at last the Allied troops would be uh, in Rome. But it went uh, on for a long time. Um, Anzio Beachhead, uh, they landed finally. I think m many got killed between Americans and Italians. And, and at last they arrived in Rome. And uh, the first the jeep that we saw arriving in Via Condotti. Via Condotti is like uh, Fifth Avenue or Bond Street, you see. So uh, uh, at last they were winning <laughs> and, and they came. Uh, they were in a very good mood. And the first jeep, we thought it was uh, American or English. And you know who they were? The Australians. And my mother, <laughs> she helped me to get into the jeep of this Australian. I remember the hats, you know, and they were drinking beer. They were very happy, they were very cheerful. And uh, they offered me beer, but I didn't drink because I was a little girl. And so <laughs> they gave me chocolates that when uh, the Allied troops were in Rome, that my mother made a great friendship with General Clark. She was always with General Clark. And then we were at the sea in a castle that belonged to um, some uh, cousins of mine. Netuno, near Anzio, near uh, the, where they landed. And uh, um, my mother was coming in the jeep dri driven by General Clark from Rome. They were great friends. And I'm sorry I don't have a photograph of them. <laughs> he was very good looking, and she <laughs> was very beautiful. So it was have been. Uh, they were happy, both very happy, because my mother she felt at home. You see, uh, with General Clark, with Americans, the most of the people were for the Allied troops, but were someone that were still for uh, the Germans. So uh, one had to be very careful one, not to show one's feelings. And something very important, as I like to say, that there was the, the captain of the SS, those very cruel people. Um, he was a general. And he was in Rome. And before leaving, well, it was the, the last days, he asked that he never uh, had the opportunity to meet the Germans, never, because we were running away from them, you see. No uh, connection with them. But he asked, all of a sudden, to visit my mother. And my mother was frightened, <laughs> you can imagine. We were here, and uh, I remember very well uh, that uh, this general um, um, came. Uh, 
very smart, very lots of dignity, and he, he bowed to my mother, and he said to her, congratulations, because I know that you've been always uh, very well balanced. You never showed the, the feelings we had because we were all for English and Americans. We were for the Allied. For Allied. But um, we didn't show it. And it was very good also for the Germans. The, he was happy. He came to thank her. But it's something extraordinary. I want to write it down. How, how well she behaved. <laughs> She was alone with me. Yes, I am very happy because I am Italian, <laughs> but I am also British. <laughs> My father was very international. He belonged to the whole world with the radio. And uh, so I feel at home very much in America. They, they understand me because I have the uh, same feelings. Um, no, my father was very human, very generous, and I have my father's feelings, also my mother. Thank you so much. Um, thank you all. Um, thank you for the attention, for all the participants and joining us on this Zoom event of the American Academy in Rome. I would like first and foremost to thank the speakers, Carlotta, Frederick, and Corey, as well as of the Principessa Marconi and the Ambassador Alessandro Cortese de Bossis to join us uh, in this event. But I want also to mention some other names that were working here behind the scene to make this uh, event today. In the first uh, place, Lynn Lancaster, the Mellon Professor here at the American Academy, uh, Matthew Ellis, a Rome Prize Fellow uh, this year, um, who were also involved in the interviews of uh, the bosses and Marconi. would like also to thank Sebastian Hill, the director of the library here, uh, Julia Barra, who organized many things here behind the scene, and Tim Twombly, the technician, and Marina Lela. Uh, but I also want to thank the British School in Rome for helping us in publicizing this event too. By the end, I just want to call your attention that the, uh, uh, our librarian has already started to scan these guided books and they are in our rare collection. We also have the very rare one that we have seen uh, made for the Jewish soldiers, which was written by Chaim Aronovich. And they, um, this will be put also online soon. Uh, you can see on the chat uh, that the uh, uh, team already shoot for you the uh, connection to this uh, online. So you can read the first book that we put, the one that was discussed here, Rome for Soldiers, um, online by moving page by page. And I'm very happy and I uh, would like to thank you by the end again. It is, a, I look through my window, it is a, a beautiful evening here in Rome. La luce è incredibile, è una serata arriva che è, spero, tranquilla. Um, so, buona serata to all and I, uh, see you soon in our next uh, um, programs here at the American Academy. Buona serata. Arrivederci. Thank you.